All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Flick at the Montana State Library here with your state librarian, Jenny Stapp, and also with um, my boss, Tracy Cook. Uh, the two of them are going to be presenting today. We've got um, a very busy agenda, so let's get started. Um, Hi, everyone. Oh, just let me one one oh. more thing real quick. Yeah. Like all of our videos, this one will be recorded. And we do have quite a bit of training coming up, so be sure to check in at Aspen um, to look at the to find the, the training events. And I do just want to highlight um, that we're going to have a meeting um, about the hotspot program. This isn't a CE event, just an online discussion at the end of the month. So watch for that or um, ask me or anybody at State Library about that, and we'll be happy to share that with you. Okay, Jenny, now I'm going to turn Thank it over you. to you. Thank <laughs> you. I was so anxious to get started. <laughs> it's okay. Great. Well, thanks everybody for joining me. I'm curious what your temperatures are around the state. It was negative 19 here this morning. Um, I do want to share a legislative update, and then I'm glad that Tracy can join us to talk a little bit about LR 130, that was the uh, resolution that was passed by the voters back in November that has impacts on some of the, the policies and how we set and enforce policies related to um, carrying of weapons within public spaces like libraries. So um, it's important guidance for her to be able to share with us. Um, we did not have a State Library Commission meeting this week. Typically, I like to hold these website chats on the Friday after a State Library Commission meeting so I can share kind of timely newsy updates from the, their particular meeting. But due to some legislative conflicts this week, uh, we have had to postpone that commission meeting. So that meeting is now scheduled for March 3rd. That's a Wednesday uh, at the same time, 9.30 in the morning. It will be available via Zoom. The agenda is posted for that meeting uh, in the commission meeting materials. And the agenda largely stays the same, but just wanted to give you all a heads up that that meeting has been postponed. There are a couple of important agenda items on that meeting that uh, you should be aware of. We're gonna continue our discussions about how we sort of think about what we've been talking about with regard to the Montana Library Network and how we can envision sort of a more systemic, systematic approach to thinking about our core library services and the role that our Network Advisory Council and other advisory and executive board play in really helping us to think very deliberately about those core services what we mean by those core services, how we measure success of those services for our patrons and our libraries, how we plan for the future of some of those kinds of services, and importantly, how we create more opportunity for wider involvement of the larger library community to help us think about and plan for library services in the future. So it's a really exciting conversation that we can to have with a variety of stakeholders and a discussion that will come up on the commission agenda. Um, specifically, the question before the commission in March will be uh, sort of how we want to reimagine the Network Advisory Council, um, the role that that council will play, sort of a job description for council members. We plan to continue to have more discussions about the Montana Library Network at Federation meetings this spring, at commission meetings, at um, the conversations with commission during the virtual MLA conference that we're excited about. So look forward to more discussion and input on that topic. Um, also at the commission meeting, Tracy is going to share an update on some of the public comment meetings that staff have been holding about the continued revisions to the Montana Public Library Standards. Um, you all know by now that we've been going through a process of modernizing and revising those public library standards and took additional input last fall to continue to further revise those standards. And we're in a public comment period right now. 
So Tracy's going to share an update with the commission at the March meeting on what we're hearing from libraries and uh, the future next steps related to those public library standards. Um, one other important topic that will be on that agenda that I want to make you aware of pertains to the, the per capita per square mile state aid. Uh, legislation ties the total amount of funding that is appropriated by the legislature for state aid to the decennial census and we're awaiting the official census count for the state of Montana. We believe that that official count will come out in March. It was due out at the end of December, but um, with all of the issues that plagued the census this last year, that official release was delayed. Uh, once we know what that official amount will be, the legislature will be able to appropriate a final amount for state aid, 40 cents per capita of whatever that final census count will be. Uh, at that point, we will know how much in total will be distributed according to the per capita per square mile formula to those public libraries that meet the public library standards. Uh, what, what is potentially going to be a bit of a hurdle for us this year is that um, that per capita per square mile formula that's in administrative rules of Montana that determine exactly what appropriation each library receives from that total is also tied to the decennial census. And um, there is a process, I talked about this in a previous website chat, whereby the census sort of fuzzes some of the data that's collected, especially in census blocks where there is a very low population. They fuzz the data to prevent anybody from being able to identify certain individuals that might otherwise be identified through the census. Privacy is a significant concern with any census data that's collected. Uh, the census is not allowed to share any data that would allow individuals themselves to be identified. And so the differential privacy process is something that the census has done for many censuses to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, there are concerns amongst many groups that the approach that the census is going to take with the 2020 census to fuzz that data might disproportionately harm especially rural areas. And we're expecting the potential for challenges to those census counts. And so Mary Craigo, the CEIC coordinator, the Census and Economic Information Center coordinator for the Department of Commerce is going to give a presentation to the commission about what that means for the state aid distribution. Um, when I asked her if we should be concerned, she said yes. I don't exactly know what that means, um, but she'll provide more information to us at the commission meeting. Um, she has advised us that for other groups that find themselves in situ similar situations where um, some kind of count or something that's tied to a financial measure it is also tied to the census, that those organizations are looking at other sources of population data to help advise them uh, on how to do any kind of per capita work that needs to be done. And so the State Library Commission is going to talk about steps that we might have to take if we lack confidence in that decennial census numbers, what alternatives might exist for us to use different sources of data or perhaps combinations of data to make sure that that distribution is as fair as possible if that decennial census is challenged in any way. Um, because that official count is tied in administrative rule, we would, if we had to use an alternate to the census, go through a, an administrative rules process to revise those rules or perhaps put in place temporary rules for this year um, that would give us the, the option of using some other kinds of data sources. So 
Um, I know that's a complex topic, but wanted to make you aware that it's, it's something that the commission is going to be considering again at their March meeting. We have a timeline worked out where if, if again, we feel like we don't have confidence or if those census numbers are in some way challenged in the courts, for example, we would have a process in place that would allow us to distribute state aid fairly and equity, equitably in the fall. Just gonna pause there and ask if there's any questions. So again, the commission meeting is going to be Wednesday, March 3rd at 9.30 in the morning. Um, those materials are, are available through the State Library Commission meeting materials, including a link to the Zoom uh, option to attend that meeting remotely. And then I just want to share a legislative update. Um, and I'll, I'll actually send out a written update later today where Today is day 30 of the legislature. So we are a third of the way through, goodness. Um, the, the primary issue that the State Library monitors is of course the State Library budget. We had a really positive hearing this past Monday, uh, the, um, what would that be, the 8th? Uh, and I just really want to shout out to Karen Ketchu and Sonia Woods. They did a fantastic job advocating for Montana libraries, talking about the importance of the work that's going on. Karen shared a story about a, a patron and her patron's use of the, the hotspot lending program and just really articulated so well the role that libraries play in our states. So thank you so much to Sonia and Karen for being brave enough to share testimony before that budget committee. Um, there's not a, a lot of significant changes in the House Bill 2 budget for the state library, some modest increases to accommodate various adjustments for pay and IT and rent costs. Um, the two significant decision packages that our budget committee are going to be considering one would appropriate a little bit more money for our natural resource and GIS programs and then the other it's called decision package 15 it would reduce the state library's appropriation of full severance tax dollars by about fifty thousand dollars but it's tied to a bill um, that's going through the legislature that would backfill the loss of coal severance tax revenue with general fund. Right now, the state library's appropriation of coal severance tax is about $567,000. And we use those monies to pay for the federation payments that go out. They help us to pay for services like OCLC and the Montana Shared Catalog. They help to fund digitization work for the Montana Memory Project, uh, digitization of our state publications that we make available online and those kinds of services. Our, as I said, our appropriation is about $567,000, but the actual revenue that's projected to come in this year is only about $430,000. So when we were creating our budget for this fiscal year, we actually budgeted about $130,000, $137,000 less than what we have authority to spend, assuming that that cash is not actually going to come in. The bill that I mentioned is taking this kind of scenario into account where if revenue continues to be low, around 400,000 or so, that difference between what is coming in in coal severance tax cash and what our appropriation is would be backfilled with general fund. And so um, decision package 15 would reduce that appropriation to right around um, 507 to $510,000 we're assuming revenue to be in the 400, 430,000. So we would see that difference made up in general fund and actually have more cash to spend 
going forward. That's the hope. Um, the bill that appropriates that general fund um, is now House Bill 374. In my legislative updates, I've listed that as LC 943. LC meaning that the bill had not yet been introduced. It's just been introduced this week. That's House Bill 374. It will have a hearing on Monday afternoon. So we'll be testifying as proponents for that bill. So those are the significant changes that um, the Education Budget Subcommittee of the legislature will be considering. They are going to take action on these kinds of change packages this coming Monday and Tuesday. So by middle of next week, the State Library will have a, a better sense of how our budget sits coming out of subcommittee. And then it will continue on through the legislative process to House Appropriations and the House floor and on to Senate finance and claims into the Senate floor. Overall, I think we're sitting pretty good. Um, Governor Gianforte's budget was relatively similar to what we saw from Governor Bullock. There weren't, weren't a lot of significant changes there. Um, there are a couple of other bills moving through the legislature. You've heard me talk now for um, going on two years about an interim study and that interim study resulted in two pieces of legislation that would help make up for some of the budget cuts the State Library faced back in 2017 to support our digital library services. Uh, those bills are House Bill 49 and House Bill 50. House Bill 49 increases the recordation fee, the document recordation key fee that people pay when they file documents at their county courthouse. Right now the State Library receives 75 cents for every page of documentation that's filed with the county and then county governments also receive 25 cents and that those funds are specifically to support GIS data development and coordination at the state and county levels. House Bill 49 would double that fee so from one dollar to two dollars with $1.50 coming to the State Library and 50 cents staying with the counties to do that work. That bill passed House Local Government Committee and is going to have a vote on the House floor at one o'clock today. So um, I'll be anxious to listen to the House floor debate this afternoon. House Bill 50 it is for a relatively new program for the State Library. It would appropriate $450,000 from the state uh, 911 fund to help the state library help local governments to improve their GIS data to make sure that local governments are able to make use of modern 911 systems that rely on geographic information systems and accurate GIS data. Um, I say it's relatively new in 2018, the State Library was funded to do an assessment of Montana's readiness to move to what's called Next Generation 911, a GIS-based 911 platform. Uh, and so this funding would then allow the State Library to help local governments to address the deficiencies that were found when that assessment was conducted. The data need to be incredibly accurate to support the public safety needs about 98% accurate. And the assessment found that um, Montana's GIS data for supporting public safety was only about 49% up to date and accurate at the time. So we would use these dollars to help address those specific needs. And then they would help benefit our collections of address and transportation data that we would then share as part of our statewide data sets. Uh, that bill passed out of committee on Wednesday afternoon. It's not yet scheduled for a vote on the House floor, but that should be coming up probably next week. So good positive momentum happening there. Ask if there's any questions before I bring up just a couple of other bills that we've been watching. There's nothing in the chat box that's come up. I did ask folks to um, just check and make sure that their full name is listed in the participants list. And if it's not, or if they have some extra folks tuning in from their login today to just post those names in the chat so I can get everybody 
um, their attendance noted in Aspen. And we've had a few of those comments come in, but uh, nothing else, Jenny. Great. I just want to give a shout out to the Montana Library Association Government Affairs Committee and um, Ann Eubank and Rachel Ron, who've been co-chairing that committee. They're doing a great job working with Nanette Gilbertson, the MLA lobbyist, keeping everybody abreast of the legislative changes that are coming along. A couple of the bills that we were looking at early in the session have been tabled. One would have required any organization that had organized children's services, including libraries, to be mandatory reporters of suspected child abuse and neglect. Um, that bill has been tabled. Another bill would have revised mill levy, mill levy election laws to require a two thirds majority vote for any local mill levy to be adopted. That bill too was tabled in committee. Tabled means that the bill is likely dead. I say likely because there are means for bills to be taken from the table and moved forward. Until we reach the transmittal deadline, that deadline is at the end of February. Um, any bill that's tabled in committee by that deadline will be dead at that point. So um, as we near the end of February, it's looking more and more likely that those bills are dead, but um, at this point there, they are tabled in committee. Uh, and then a, a number of other bills that we're watching, um, just kind of monitoring to see what if any impact they might have. Um, one LC3054 um, would put requirements on telecommunication advisor, uh, providers to filter internet for any devices for people under 18. That bill, last I checked, has not been introduced. Um, again, there, there are deadlines for these bills to have made it through the process in one house. So as we get closer to the end of February, any of these bills that haven't been introduced are likely not going to be introduced at that point. Um, the other bill that um, should come up in the next few weeks or a couple of months is LC2877. That's the broadband study resolution that the State Library and the Montana Library Association are supporting. Uh, it would call upon the legislature to conduct a study during the interim to look at a wide variety of both policy and funding needs that the state faces in order to address concerns about the adequacy of broadband. That study resolution has been sponsored by Senator Pat Flowers. Um, and we've been working with a broad group of stakeholders, including telecommunication advisors and people from the education community and the Economic Developers Association to support that study resolution. Study resolutions are a little bit different in bills uh, than bills. They have later deadlines to be introduced. So this resolution doesn't need to be introduced until uh, mid to late March before it would then make its way through that legislative process. These study resolutions don't go to the governor for a signature. Any study resolution that's passed by the legislature then gets voted on um, by the legislative body so that they can rank and prioritize study resolutions to be studied during the interim. So a slightly different process for that study resolution. I asked Tracy if there's any other bills that she wanted to share updates on. Uh, yeah, I had a couple and I forgot to look up the number for Greg Hertz's bill about sunsetting mill levies. Um, that is back for redo. At this point in time, it actually, the original language excluded libraries. So I've been watching that one very carefully to see what changes are happening. Um, you know, I'm just not sure what language might be changing at this point, but I did want to let you know I am watching that one very closely. That bill basically would say that uh, mill levies would sunset after I believe it's 10 years. 
and MLA worked very hard in the previous session to get libraries as an exemption. And like I said, they, they were in there in the original language of the bill. I'm not sure what the changes are at this point. And then the other bill I was watching pretty closely was Senate Bill 80, which was about limiting the duration of interlocal agreements. And I just know that many, many of you on here um, do operate under an interlocal agreement. And I'm very happy to report that the sponsor made an amendment and he basically uh, took out the language that would have impacted every single kind of interlocal agreement and he's actually just focused on subdivisions. So um, that was actually a happy thing to see. And I, I think those are the, the two um, at this point, Jenny, that you've mentioned the others that I've been watching as well. Great, thanks Tracy. So as I said, we're nearing some key deadlines when um, we'll know what of these pieces of legislation are going to continue to move forward in the legislative process and which ones will die either for um, lack of transmittal or, or lack of having been introduced. Uh, overall, I think a, a good session so far. And um, just again, want to express my appreciation to the Government Affairs Committee for their activity. Uh, it's really helpful to have a group of people to help monitor bills and to share ideas and concerns and questions we have as legislation comes up. Um, two thirds of the way still to go, but I think right now I'm cautiously optimis optimistic that from a budget perspective, things are looking good um, and I'm not seeing any legislation that's too concerning for us at this point. And I'll stop and ask if there's any questions before I turn it over to Tracy. Jenny? Yeah. Um, hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> I do have a question. There was one I was watching about um, requiring library personnel to report um, suspicious things about child, possible child. Okay. Yep. Can you comment on that at all? Um, it is tabled in committee, so likely dead. Um, MLA did not take a position on the bill. The primary concern that uh, uh, some of the opponents raised was that in addition to requiring library staff or staff of organizations to be mandatory reporters, it would have required volunteers to be mandatory reporters as well. And we've talked about that in the MLA Government Affairs Committee, and I know that that point in particular was concerning for librarians. Had this bill moved forward, MLA's plan was to work with the sponsor to suggest legislative language that would have required the state to uh, put together a mandatory training resources so that all of us would have received training on what to watch for, what would be worth reporting, what kinds of things wouldn't be worth reporting, um, how we would address concerns of implicit bias, those kinds of things. So um, again, the bill is tabled, so we haven't taken any of those kinds of action at this point. Thank you. Bet, you know. Tracy, I hope you have water in your building. Yes, actually, I found a heater and the pipes are thawing. There is one leak, so there might be a slight crack. The joys oh. of being an HOA officer, folks, the, I had a call, frantic call from someone saying that the pipes in our first floor bathroom were frozen. So the joys of below zero weather. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I would like to talk about LR130. And a few of you are very astute and pay close attention to these things and have asked me about this. LR130, in a nutshell, basically 
limits the ability of local governments um, and library boards to uh, prohibit weapons in the library. And you can still prohibit uh, open carry of weapons. Um, you can also prohibit the carrying of concealed weapons if the person does not have a permit. However, you know, up until this point in time, if libraries wish to do so or local governments, they could actually per, uh, prohibit weapons in a public building. But there was an issue on the ballot that was voted on that kind of changed that ability to be able to prohibit weapons in the building. The Montana Association of County Officers has a very nice white paper that I will uh, send out to public library directors for you to have. I think it does a really nice job of basically explaining your rights and what you can uh, and cannot do. Um, I don't know how many of you might at this point in time have a policy of no weapons in your library, but if you do, you will need to kind of take a look at it and make sure that it is focused on simply prohibiting open carry of weapons or prohibiting the carrying of concealed weapons without a permit. It's probably unlikely that if someone's carrying a concealed weapon, you will know. Um, and I wouldn't blame you if you felt a little uncomfortable asking if you did see a weapon. However, you do have the right if you see a weapon to ask the person if they have a permit. So those are kind of the, the key points about it. I just kind of want to pause and see if you had any questions about this. Oh. And like I said, I will send that white paper out so that you have it. And definitely after you read it, if you have any questions, you can let me know. I am happy to help you uh, any way that I can. And I don't have it on the agenda, but I do actually also want to put in a little plug and a thank you. Many of you kind of answered my call to give us information about your mill levies in really a short time frame. And that was very helpful. I mean, I'm grateful that the bill requiring two thirds vote is tabled and I hope it remains that way. However, it is likely that it or some other form of a mill levy limitation bill is going to arise in future sessions. And so I would really appreciate it for those of you who maybe did not get a chance to complete that survey and I'll, I'll copy the post the link in the agenda. I'd be really grateful if you would take another look at it and just reach out to me if you have questions. It is very technical. I, I however, found it very useful to see your answers to my questions, um, both to be able to just kind of come up with an argument for why um, there shouldn't be a requirement for a supermajority to pass mill levy votes, but also just, just kind of understand uh, how many voted mill levies we have in Montana and how many are permanent versus durational. That kind of information is very useful. I also think it's kind of wise to know what you have, and I realize that those can be hard questions, but I am happy to help you and help you work with your clerk um, or treasurer, because they would be the ones to know to try and find the information to that. So I did want to kind of use this as an opportunity to put in a little plug to ask you to complete that survey if you haven't done so. So I will go ahead and post that in the chat, um, but at this point, those two things were kind of all I had. Um, and thank you again, Jenny, for giving me an opportunity to talk about those at your chat. Absolutely. So, Tracy, this is Nancy with Buzzworth. <laughs> Could you clarify that that gun thing again? Does that mean we cannot stop somebody from coming in with a gun? Is that what your is what it ended up being? I guess I read the whole bill wrong. So, um, if they are openly carrying a weapon like they have it literally in their hands you can prohibit that if it's a concealed weapon and they have a permit you cannot deny them entry into the library if they have a concealed weapon and they don't have a permit you could deny them entry it's a very it's very confusing 
basically you can no longer prohibit concealed weapon carry in the library if the person has a permit. Does that help? Yeah, it helps. Okay. Except if they're carrying concealed, you won't know that they've got a gun and I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they don't carry those permits on them and <laughs> I'm not going to argue with somebody with a gun. Yeah, I don't think many people are. <laughs> but but this is Joe Tracy. Um this means you you can't have a a policy though that says no weapons allowed. Right. Yep. So what about, but this is just addressing guns. I mean, oftentimes we have, I've seen um, policies about knives being over a certain length. Mm -hmm. Does this affect that? You know, the way that, and I have to admit, I don't know, are you, given a concealed permit for anything other than a gun it says weapons so it's basically the the changes in the law took away a local government's power to regulate the carrying of concealed weapons it doesn't say just guns but i confess i do not know I, uh, what the concealed permitting process allows um, i always think of guns but does it allow knives? That's a good question. Yeah, we should probably do some more research because I never thought about that either, Tracy. Yeah, I will try to find out, Nancy. I just won't bring my butcher knife to the library to peel my apple anymore. Those are the points I wanted to cover today. I think you probably all saw that Governor Gianforte uh, rescinded the mask mandate, the statewide mask mandate today. And Tracy sent out some helpful guidance to library directors yesterday about um, the need to make sure you understand your local directives, which might be different from state directives. And then a reminder that library boards do have the authority to set their own policies if your board wishes to do so. So um, be sure that you're aware of that information. We'll be having an upcoming um, COVID check-in to talk about those kinds of issues in a little bit more detail as well. This is Joe, I, and I just, on that topic, we, you know, we state employees received a communication today about um, publicly facing uh, persons who are working in state offices still have to wear a mask and um, you know there's still quite a few situations where pub where state employees are are required so that might be helpful for people to know if um, if they are looking to institute you know mask um, policies at their library but you but I'm sure you're right you know it's getting on board with your local municipalities where it's at right now. I have the um, unenviable task of informing you that we have fallen well below our hour today. So you only get a half a credit for attending. Um, I hate saying that. Um, so don't, luckily no one can throw tomatoes at me. Um, tomatoes are too expensive this time of year anyway. But um, I will be getting the uh, your attendance noted in Aspen. Thanks everybody for posting to the to the chat so I get those those names. It takes me a little while to do that, but it should be done by the end of the day. And with that, if you don't guys don't have anything else, I'm going to stop our recording. Yes. Okay. Go ahead.